Hello and welcome to Convict Inc. I'm your host, Robert Rosso. If you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so. If you like this video, please push like and share it with your family, friends, neighbors, enemies, etc. Also, membership is up, $2.99. Please support the channel. There'll be two more tiered memberships coming soon. Crime, murder, human fascination with crime and murder. 2020, Dateline, 48 hours. Cold case, couples who kill, killer couples, fatal attraction. You go on and on and on and all these shows about murder. And boy, how we watch. Some of us are appalled by the murders. Oh my God, I can't believe this person or that person or that couple did this. And we watch and we wait. Did they get convicted? Did they die? Did they get in a shootout? Did they beat the trial? Did they? Are they free today? Whatever. But really, we watch because of morbid fascination. Really, that's that's one of the things that happens. I say this so because you should not judge me or anybody in prison who sits around and listens to people talk about murder and laugh. We become desensitized to murder in prison. We hear about it so much that it just becomes part of the norm. So if a person is talking about killing somebody in a, in a manner in which is comical, sometimes we laugh. In 2006, at the United States Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, I was out on the yard sitting in the white section, which was next to the bathroom, a yellow bench, little grass area. I think they called that Peckerwood Beach. Maybe they did at that prison. Different prisons have little Peckerwood, Peckerwood Beach or Peckerwood Park, whatever. Um, when there was a guy talking about a murder in which he was involved in. This guy from Boston, shout out to Boston, was named Derek Capozzi. Derek Capozzi was involved in the murder of a girl named Ashley Silva. Ashley Silva, just 19 at the time of her death, which is April the 13th, 1996, was the girlfriend of a guy named Kevin Muse. Kevin Muse, Derek Capozzi, and others were involved in a drug gang, says the media, who was loosely associated or associated with the Patriarca family out of Rhode Island. The boss of this drug gang, Big Big Paul, or Pauly A.D., uh, Di Calgirio, Di Calgiro, I, I say, I'm Italian, I saw his Italian names wrong. Di Calgiro, I hope that's how you say it. So, Big Paul, or Big Polly, or Big Polly AD, there's a bunch of different ways, Decal Gerio, and I know you guys from Boston are going to hit me up, just go ahead and put on the convicts, uh, comment section and correct me, was the leader of this so-called drug gang. Apparently, Ashley, whose only real mistake it appeared was being with Kevin in the beginning, uh, perhaps she was a street girl, but was with Kevin nonetheless, uh, was unfortunate of seeing these gang members um, commit crimes. Specifically, they had guns in her apartment. Uh, that's what reports say. She knew too much about the inner workings of this so-called drug gang. And Big Paul, Big Polly, Big Polly, a decent whacker. Again, this was Kevin Muse's girlfriend. Um, when I heard Derek Capozzi telling this story, uh, I, I instantly knew, like, or was wondering, I should say, how did anybody ever think they were going to get away with this crime? Number one, there was too many people involved. I remember a car rent. There was car rentals. There was moving cars here and there. They tried to kill the girl. They, they tried to poison her. They tried to give her a hot shot. And finally, she was strangled to death. After she was strangled to death, she was her body was cut up. They have... Um, tapes of Derek, I believe, coming out of a store with bags of lye. And to this day, the girl's body has never been found. Again, when Derek was telling it, he was telling it in a manner which was matter of fact, yet, I'm sorry, a little comical. No offense to the family. And I know that sounds bad, but it's the truth. Um, he was not laughing. It was just the way it was. It was almost like a dumber than dumb case. 
And I don't mean no disrespect to Derek or his guys. I'm just saying that's that's the way I took it. Also, Derek Capozzi represented himself at trial. That's what really caught my eye. I was doing a legal work at the time, and he knew what he was talking about. He knew the law. Um, anyway, I said Ashlyn. Ashlyn. I hope I got the name. Ashlyn Silver. Did I say Ashley? It's Ashlyn Silver. Silva. Eventually, everybody was arrested, and Derek Capozzi represented himself at trial. Prior to trial, Kevin Muse, the boyfriend, couldn't handle it. He hung it up. He killed himself. After what they, after what he did or what he was a part of with his girlfriend or what he witnessed somebody else do, he couldn't handle it in the morning. He hung it up. Uh, killed himself, hung himself in prison. At the time of the trial, Derek was already serving 30-year sentence for extortion. Ultimately, he went to trial and he was convicted and received 23 years. Now, he was not convicted of murder. I want to say it was firearm charges. There was a RICO case, but they dropped the RICO charges, I believe. And ultimately, he ended up with 23 years um, for crimes involved, including or involving this murder. I left Lewisburg in 2007, January 2007. From there, I went to Butner, and shortly thereafter, Derek was sent to a prison in California. At that prison, Derek was stabbed in the chest and um, later was transferred to another facility. In 2010, um, while being tr transported in a U.S. Marshal van in Kentucky, uh, I believe he was going to a trial to attend a trial or of a friend or being transferred to a prison in Kentucky for holding or a county jail. He escaped, kicked the prison van open, boom, escapes. And on the run for three days, he was. Uh, media reports say that he was hidden out in a dentist office. Eventually, he was found on some railroad tracks by some locals. One of the unfortunate mistakes Derek Capozzi made was he escaped in a rural place in Kentucky or a place similar to where I live now, where if somebody was coming through here that was an escaped con, uh, the whole town would be out after him with guns and pitchforks. So that was one of his mistakes. Again, Derek was indicted and at trial, he attempted to say that the reason he escaped was because he wanted medical attention. He said that his medical attention in the Bureau of Prison was so lacking and inadequate that he needed to get help by escaping. There were other accounts that said when he was caught that he said the reason he escaped was because he was all in doing 53 years, meaning it was basically his life was over or he's going to be too old when he got out. He had 53 years. What else did he have to lose? After being convicted on that case, and I believe he's got 51 months, he, he received another sentence for the escape. He was sentenced, he was sent back to Lewisburg, which at this time was no longer a USP or a high security prison. It was a SMU, um, a special management unit program, a special management unit where they have people locked down. It's where they put, it's where they put all the troublemakers at that time. After that, Derek got out and there are reports that he assaulted, either stabbed or assaulted a correctional officer. The dates are unclear to me and I couldn't, I couldn't really pin that down. Earlier today, I talked to a guy from Boston who I did time with at Lewisburg, who I will have on my show, who has been on Ch Chad Marks' show in the past, and we got to talking about Derek Capozzi. Um, it came up. Derek Capozzi eventually went to Lee County uh, in Virginia, and there was a white guy on the compound from Boston who was making knives, manufacturing knives, weapons, and selling them to other white guys. Now, Typically, in federal prison, especially in USPs, if a white guy makes a knife, he cannot sell them to other races. That is, you cannot be white and sell knives to blacks, Mexicans, and so forth. Plenty of white guys do. Plenty of Mexicans make knives and sell them to whites and blacks. There are blacks that make knives and sell them to whites and Mexicans. It is their hustle. That is how they support themselves. However, you're not supposed to do that because there's this perpetual, ongoing, never-ending threat of a race war. And it happens. So you wouldn't want to be white and sell a knife to a Mexican who can turn around and kill you with it or one of your people with it or one of your soldiers or one of the white guys, whatever. 
Well, the federal prisons now, there's so many cliques, groups, and gangs, even within blacks and whites and Mexicans themselves, that when Derek found out that a white guy from Boston was making knives and selling them to other whites, he said, that's not going to happen. Now, let me tell you something about Derek Capozzi. This is a guy who would ball up his mattress in prison and, and punch it for eight hours a day. Eight hours a day. He can do backflips. <sighs> burpees, nonstop, all day. Just do burpees. Work out all day. Jiu-Jitsu, Kung Fu, martial arts, UFC. Um, allegedly, he had training and all this stuff. You can tell Derek Capozzi is, is, is a fighting machine. Derek Capozzi went out on the yard, found out that this white guy had not stopped selling knives to other white people that were not from Boston. And he took something that was similar to an ice pick, walked out on the yard, said nothing, and went up and stabbed this guy right in the jaw. Derek Capozzi definitely is, uh, has made a name for himself within the Federal Bureau of Prisons and indeed in in mass, in mass in general. I can't say Massachusetts was. <laughs> uh, the guys from Boston, Charlestown area, uh, Bet, uh, New Bedford, what was this? Um, uh, Medford, whatever. Uh, they know who I'm talking about. There'll be a lot of people who know who I'm talking about. And you guys and, and girls and people who know more about Capozzi and want to weigh in, if you want to correct me on anything I said wrong, that's fine. I'm not always 100% right. I have read um, media reports about it. I did talk to one of the guys that knew him well. I knew him when I was at Lewisburg. So I just put together this story. Um, trust me, this, this, this hits the highlights anyway. I'm sure there's plenty more. I'm sure you guys can add more detail and context. So I'm going to start, I'm going to end by going back to the beginning. The crime in which um, ultimately led to the conviction, uh, his federal conviction, the murder of Miss Silva, was terrible indeed. Um, again, when he explained it, because of the way he explained it, it was uh, just, it was crazy. And I do remember a bunch of us out there and we're just going like, <laughs> you know, and, and definitely we're laughing not about the girl being killed, but about everything that happened around it. How they try to poison her, how they gave her hot shot. She just wouldn't, she would not die. Ultimately, she was strangled. That was not super easy. Um, I am sorry if anybody knows her. I don't mean to, to de demean her name or, or bring up any other bad memories, but this is the truth. This is my story. These are stories within the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and now there are stories being put out on YouTube. So, Derek Capozzi. Legend amongst Boston prisoners, for sure. Many badges of honor. Escape, assaulting an officer, assaulting a, a Boston guy, stabbing a Boston guy through the neck. Um, these are big things. He did. That's, those are big, big moves when you're a convict from Boston in the federal prison system or even in the state. So I had to do the Capozzi story. I'm glad for the person who called me today and we'll be talking in the future. And there's another one from Convict Inc. Have a good day.